Hello and welcome to the Property News Show. I'm here again with Mark Homer this week. Uh, we've got three exciting stories to cover this week. So our first story today is we've got this story from Rightmove and it is saying that despite record rents, um, still a high percentage of landlords are still looking to sell. Um, that seems slightly counterintuitive. You know, you think as rents are rising, people would want to keep those properties for the, the, for the yields. You know, what do you think about this, Mark? Has this got anything to say about the market? Do you have any strong feelings on this? We well, say it's counterintuitive, but I think it is a, a symptom of the fact that landlords, less landlords are buying, mm -hmm. less landlords are um, keeping their properties and, and more are selling. Uh, therefore, there is less supply of rental properties in the market uh, and therefore rents are rising. So um, I think it's an entirely ration, uh, economically rational uh, uh, consequence of um, increased taxes, stamp duty, uh, obviously the, the, the capital gains tax, but the big one is the, the um, inability to offset all the mortgage interest. And this is exactly what was predicted and now it's all playing out. So are you selling any? Uh, I'm not selling any at all. Um, I see this as um, quite positive. I mean, clearly we had the interim period uh, where rents, um, they did spike a little bit actually around, around the sort of just before the stamp duty um, went or just after the stamp duty went up because uh, there was a big sort of um, there was a big drop in new purchases um, around that period but um, yeah it's really sort of gathering steam now and, 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 and rents are rising um, and um, I just see that as a very very positive thing for those those who are holding it's 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 more difficult to buy uh, but I think if you're committed and you're tenacious you go out and you, you, know, you, you, you go and see a load of lenders, uh, you go and view a load of properties, you can, you can get those deals and clearly yields are better than, better than they have been in, in many years. So, you know, what do you think of the reasons this might be? We talked, you know, last week and, you know, it's a kind of ongoing theme about the increased regulation and changes to like stamp duty and taxes. Are those factors that are going to cause, you know, more landlords to sell or, or is there anything else? Well, I mean, clearly stamp duty has gone up if you're purchasing uh, an individual buy-to-let property. Um, so I think it's the perception of increased tax and the media um, putting this sort of front page, which has put lots of people off buy-to-let and driven them down another path. But they can go and buy equities or bonds or, you know, whatever else. Um, but um, they'll usually find the returns are nowhere near as good. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, they'll usually find um, um, that, um, well, I find the, 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 um, the, the returns can be more volatile um, from, you know, your sort of more traditional, I don't know, equities, bonds. Um, maybe they're looking at smaller investments through EIS. I've just, uh, looks like, lost a, a reasonable chunk of money through an EIS scheme. Can we just um, quickly tell the viewers what EIS is? Yeah, so it's Enterprise Investment Scheme. Um, you have to invest in smaller, risky startup style companies, but you get tax breaks for doing it. Clearly, um, by their very nature, um, they're a lot more volatile, and um, clearly you're a lot less likely to, um, to be successful in each one. But when you get a unicorn, you get one that's very, very successful, it should make up for the other others and, and some. But compared to property, return on capital invested, when you, you borrow some money and, uh, and buy a unit and take, take the rent, you can be over 20, 25 percent very easily on, on buy to let once you take into account the leverage that you can apply. So you think, you know, it's a kind of a case of almost a false fear and people not understanding what's going on when reality is you can still make very good money. Yeah, if you of know course. I mean, this, this was always the case. You know, inability to offset all the mortgage interest, whilst a big thing, affects people who are buying in their own names, not if you're buying a limited company. So you're buying a limited company, that sorts that. Um, stamp duty well if you're buying individual properties you've probably just got to take it on the chin pay the extra three uh, percent if you're converting buildings you don't pay it if you're um, um, yeah if you're you're taking a, a commercial building and, and putting it to residential clearly you just pay a, a commercial rate of stamp duty or if there's some commercial um, mixed in with the residential that you're buying maybe it's a mixed use building again you pay a, a commercial rate of stamp duty so that's another way around it um, but it's not you know, it's not huge. You factor that in. Maybe you pay a little bit less for, for the property. Should be a 20-year-plus investment anyway. Um, so, um, 
of course, it's, it's the media driving this as mm -hmm. usual. It's a bit like the last recession. Um, most of the buyers ran away. Had the rents really changed? No, they were stable, uh, carried on growing through the recession, um, and it just meant the yields increased. Um, so we ended up getting lots of cheap property because the mm. media were smashing property so much. Absolutely. Which is uh, clearly they'll move on to something mm. else. Landlords will start buying again, and then it'll be property's mm. turn again with the next issue, uh, whenever that may be. Yeah. Well, as you said, it's all a roller coaster. It has its ups and downs, and you just got to be buying and selling at the right point. It's cyclical. Uh, so you're, you're you're at various points in this cycle, um, and and at the moment the messaging, the media. Uh, messaging is negative um, mm. on, on property taxation, residential property taxation. Uh, but it has been on retail, on commercial. Mm. Um, and for me, that's presented uh, a few good opportunities to purchase retail to convert into residential. Um, so I quite like the negative. When, when the news goes negative on mm. something, when they've been doing it for long enough, usually the capital values of that asset class are depressed enough and, and at a level where I'd want to enter, mm. um, best not when everyone thinks it's a great idea. Well, you're, you're, you're known to be quite contrarian with your investing techniques, um, hence why when everyone's selling, you're buying. <laughs> so our uh, second story here is some changes to um, capital gains tax. Um, you know, there's several things here, a payment deadline change, PRR relief changes. Um, you know, these are coming into effect in April 2020 and are going to obviously impact people who are investors and, and landlords. Are you able to kind of talk us through these a little bit and, um, you know, you know, let uh, anyone watching know if it's going to you know, make any changes for them? Yeah, I mean, this, this just affects people who were living in their own home and then rented it out subsequent to moving out, probably because they couldn't sell it. Mm -hmm. um, now, you used to get three years relief, so you could then rent it after you moved out for another three years and not pay any capital gains tax on any rises within those three years when you weren't living in the property. Um, that's been reduced to 18 months, and shortly that's going to come down to nine months. Um, so basically, you need to get the things sold mm -hmm. a lot quicker when you move out of it. Um, that's all right. So, so the, the, the effect of this is you may end up having to pay the capital gains tax in the worst um, in, in the worst case, 20 month, 21 months earlier, if you sold the property on the 5th of April, let's say you sold the property on the 5th of April 2019, mm -hmm. you then wouldn't have to account for that until January 2021 when you put right. your personal tax return in um, because you'd be dealing with the April 19 to April 20 tax year you'd put the tax return in at the end of January 2021 and pay the capital gains tax at that point. So in the worst case, you're paying it sort of 21 mm -hmm. months earlier, but clearly you're likely to yeah. sell it at another point during the year. So it's not a major thing. So you said this is specific only to um, if I own a property that I live in and then I move and rent that out, specifically that scenario, not if I own, buy another and rent that out. Yeah, it's just for... Well, it's capital gains tax when you sell any property. Okay. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going to have to pay your capital gains mm. tax earlier, okay. um, regardless of whether you're moving out to, to, to you know, to if, if it's just your own home, you're not mm. going to pay capital gains tax. Um, if it's your own home and you sell it within nine months of, of you, 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 well, you move out and you rent it for nine months, which I wouldn't say is particularly practical anyway, because mm -hmm. you want to put a tenant in there for six months and then have to... Um, work around them for viewings and in, in have have quite a likely scenario mm -hmm. where that the property is not in the same condition mm -hmm. uh, as as when you left it, uh, and therefore you're going to have to do remedial works. Um, so you have to, and shortly if they get rid of the section 21, you won't be able to move them out anyway, mm -hmm. or you will, but you'll have jumps hoops to jump through. So you're going to be into capital gains tax after month nine anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I suggest that what this has effectively done is. Um, is, is, is it, it's meant that you can't let your property out mm. after you've um, been living in it yeah. if you want to pay zero capital gains tax. So obviously all this stuff is like, you know, quite complex and changes, you know, not often, but it does change. And 
you know, you keep abreast of all this stuff. You've got obviously a vested interest in, but a lot of, you know, other landlords and investors don't. So could you just tell, you know, how do you keep track of all this stuff? What's your sources for, you know, keeping abreast of all the news and changes? Well, clearly I read um, a lot and um, I'll read the FT um, and, you know, I, I, I dart around other publications. So I'm, I'm um, you know, I'm watching the news and I'm watching when the, the government sort of release stuff. The issue with taking secondhand news like that is it's mm -hmm. often wrong or because a journalist writing it who doesn't necessarily invest or understand themselves, they just, they, they, they deliver it in the wrong context or they sort of miss the point so you end up getting the wrong end of the stick. Um, so when I need specific um, advice or, or guidance, often I go on the HMRC website which has to be um, uh, legally and um, in, in language terms quite tight mm -hmm. um, so I find that quite useful and I, I cut and paste things yeah. off there and send them to solicitors and Very accountants hard to argue with. and uh, I, I can't even remember the last time an accountant <laughs> or solicitor argued with um, the guidance that was on HMRC's website so I find that very useful um, and the, the other way I, I, um, I, I work out what's going on is is you know we've got a good accountant uh, when I've got a technical, a specific question, something I, I, I want to do, um, I go to him, I ask for advice, I usually have to pay him sometimes a few thousand pounds and he writes the advice in a letter um, and then I, I keep the letter mm -hmm. um, to make sure that uh, we follow it properly and if there's an issue then, then he's got to sort it out. You think the um, HMRC website is an underused resource by Yeah, you know, I think investors? it's good. Yeah, because... Um, you know, it's a bit like the health and safety executive. You talk to th three project managers or mm -hmm. CDM controllers about health and safety, they'll give you three different answers. Uh, and it's a bit like that with accountants. Um, if you go on the HSC website or the HMRC website, it's there in black and white, or in, in HMRC's case, it's there in green and white. <laughs> um, and um, it's great because um, it whilst, you know, it's not all there and it's not all, doesn't all necessarily relate to the circumstance which you are looking at, um, usually it's um, it's undeniable to solicitors and accountants who know less uh, about the topic than you will end up knowing mm. once you've done your reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So our third story today, um, we're talking about a 11th consecutive month of increases for um, commercial rents. Um, you know, 0.4% on average, but some areas, you know, we're seeing as high as 3.3. And actually, weirdly, most of those, the higher increases are not in, in London. They're in the West Midlands and the North. Um, obviously, this is a good thing for, you know, people who are developing commercial properties. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, I think it depends what type of commercial property you're talking about. And there are clearly, there are three main use classes. Um, you've got retail, which mm -hmm. has been um, really panned in the press and, you know, the the sentiment has been negative towards retail because online is, you know, in, 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 because online mm -hmm. is, um, according to the media, um, taking a lot of the business off the high street and, and putting it into sheds, you know, and, and, and people are having a lot more home delivery, which is clearly happening. Uh, but maybe not to the extent that they describe. So retail rents have been falling, lots of CVAs, um, big groups have been going through um, insolvency procedures so that mm -hmm. they can reduce their rents. Um, quite a few high streets have got voids or empty properties on them. Um, so you've got to sort of take all that into account um, when looking at the average rents that are falling. And I'd say the capital values have been falling off the back of that. Um, offices, I'd say, the, the, the precisely the reverse has been happening. Um, lots of offices have been taken out of the market and converted into residential buildings. So then there is now in many areas um, a, a shortage of offices, um, certainly around Peterborough. Um, office rents have been rising. Mm. Uh, capital values have been rising. Uh, coming out of the last recession, clearly there's more demand, but Brexit's dampened, um, you know, dampen that somewhat, I'd say less businesses are investing or mm. wanting to take on new buildings uh, just because of subdued or their perception of subdued um, economic growth or uncertainty 
uh, with, with what's going on in Parliament at the moment. Um, and then the big sheds, the third use class, which is uh, B8 storage and distribution, warehouses, sheds, um, you know, the, those that they've seen a big uptick. Um, the narrative or the story is that people um, believe that um, the market is moving online. Um, lots of businesses therefore need uh, warehouses to store uh, and to, um, you know, fulfil and deliver uh, mm. the goods which sometimes retailers are selling but lots of time people are directly buying online. Uh, they need a counter, they need some hard standing outside. Uh, so rents have been rising the strongest in those three use classes that I've been seeing and, and capital values off the back of that as well. Um, so um, it's an interesting market. It, it depends what, uh, mm. what use class you're looking at. So obviously, you know, um, in city centres like uh, where Progressive used to be in um, Queen Street in uh, central Peterborough, you know, those kind of buildings, they are, are suitable to be converted into uh, residential at some point. You know, and lots of city centre buildings can be converted. You know, where we are now, for example, we're in an industrial estate outside the, the city centre. You know, this kind of area is never going to be suitable to be converted into residential, really? you wouldn't think. Or, well, or, or, you know, do you think it could be? You know, the buildings aren't, aren't you know, I wouldn't say, like, built for that. But I was going to say to you, like, do you think that there is, you know, there will be a, a drive and eventually all the possible conversions will have been done because you're not going to want houses, you know, in this kind of area or on this estate? Or do you think that's something that we're going to see change in the future as well? Well, it's happened in Peterborough. I mean, there is, um, there is a block of around 100 flats mm. on an industri a true industrial estate. There was an office building there mm. and they used permitted development rights to convert it. Um, I bid on the building. I was a little bit nervous, mm. uh, but they got it very cheap. And clearly the capital values, um, once it was converted, were quite low. Um, but yeah, that, that, that happened. Um, buildings like these that we're in at the mm. moment, often they're controlled by some sort of covenant or mm -hmm. there's a management company in operation, as there is on this site. Um, you know, there is the, there's a management company um, which prevents conversion of these buildings yeah. into residential. However, um, constitution and covenants can be changed mm -hmm. uh, or removed um, and, and restrictive covenants can be um, expunged um, if if you know if if you get the permit the consent of the the, the holder of the covenant um, site like this if you you own maybe five or six of the buildings uh, each one of the buildings represents one share of the management company uh, clearly if you've got control of the management company you can change what you mm -hmm. like um, so I suspect if somebody owned five or six of the buildings on this site. Uh, they could remove that covenant and convert them all into residential. Um, yeah, it might not look, uh, you know, on first glance as the right site. Mm. And clearly the values on this site as offices are too high once yeah. you take into account the cost of conversion. So it doesn't work at the moment. But at some point in the future, it may work. Uh, you may put a, another floor on the top. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you render um, or change the appearance. Um, you know, you... you, you as long as you do all the office buildings within an area like this, then then maybe it works. So you think you know, as the uh, you know city centre, let's call them a traditional uh, commercial to residential conversions get used up, you're going to see more and more, you know, um, different and you know um, risky or potentially like you know conversions happen or more unorthodox conversions happen. Yeah. In you know what would have been office Possible. parks and yeah. industrial parks and stuff like that. Possible. Yeah. Um, especially as um, you know, office values have, have gone up and up. Mm. Um, I, you know, it, that doesn't help from a, a conversion no. um, standpoint because clearly it's uneconomic to convert a lot of office buildings. Uh, but the ones on the industrial parks, well, the capital values are, are not, mm. not quite the same. So um, every now and again, one works. Uh, there was another one actually that came up, uh, and I think the council managed to stop it because. There was a stream not that far away, so they managed to stop it through flood risk because okay. they obviously desperately don't want this Didn't to happen. Yeah. Um, but you know, every now and again it does. Okay. Um, also, you mentioned a little bit earlier, and it relates to this story as well, um, 
you know, you've got a combination, several combinations now of um, where you've converted commercial to residential, but with retail still in it. Is that something you've done, um, you know, through choice and you, you want to have that or is it just um, you, you've either had to or, or it made economic sense to keep the retail in? I'd say both. Um, in the locations um, that I think you're talking about or that yeah. the buildings that, that you're talking about that we've been doing, um, those are still shopping precinct mm -hmm. um, and the, gra the highest value um, for the ground floor would be as retail when, well, clearly there's also not the cost of converting it. Of course, so yeah. Once you take all that into account, the economic argument is, is definitely weighed towards leaving it as retail. In addition to that, I have just tested the idea of uh, taking retail right down to the ground floor with mm -hmm. the planners. Um, and I've got responses like, that would look really weird. Oh, we don't like that. Mm, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I don't think they're ready for that in no. that location. Um, so clearly, it's not worth it from a commercial point of view. And the planners don't like the idea. So they're probably not going to let you do yeah. it. So it's a simple, yep. simple answer And so, if, you know, for people doing, you know, their own or looking at their own, you know, they need to consider, you know, when they're doing it, you know, although you might be converting... A commercial into a residential you might still want to keep part of it as retail if it makes economic sense i think it does and there's a, a sort of simple um uh, you know a, a simple way of looking at this if you know what does the street scene look like mm -hmm. um are you if you walk up and down that street and there's retail on every ground floor yeah you know every building on the ground floor is retail um then it's it, it's clearly it's a pretty simple equation. Yeah. Um, you know, if you if you go and talk to the planners about mm. converting uh, the ground floor, especially as retail, you know, they're trying to keep it. They're trying to keep you know the employment and economic activity rolling. Um, they're not going to like it. You think they're uh, a bit softer on you if you keep the retail in? Uh, yeah, I think they well, they're more supportive. Yeah. If you go in there, it helps and you all the way. Of course, if you go in there and say, well, you know, bugger you. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go for it. You can refuse it, and then I'm gonna, I'm mm. gonna appeal on all the top, you know, on the ground floor, higher. whatever. Then of course they're gonna go against you. Um, in that location, actually, if you move one street back, um, they'll let you can convert the whole mm. building to residential right to the ground floor because the street scene, um, you know, lends itself to it's that. A, it's a high street. Isn't yeah, it, that know? is the current, you know, that is the character of that street. Um, if you're trying to change or move away from the current character of um, a street in terms of the use classes and, and visual visual appeal, um, then that's when you encounter this, yeah, more, more, more friction from, from planners. Okay, so to finish off today, we've got some questions from our community gathered by Kieran, our community manager. Um, so Mark, we're going to do these really short and quick. We're going to give you 90 seconds to answer each question. So for anyone watching, if you want to get your question answered, you can ask them in our community on Facebook. That's the Progressive Property Community. And um, the ones we like, we're going to put on the show and Mark will answer for you. So are you ready, Mark? Far away. Okay, so our first question today is landlord insurance. What does it cover and why do you need it? So if you're talking about buildings insurance, uh, landlord buildings insurance, it normally would cover a rebuild cost of uh, putting the, the, the building right. Um, some cover malicious damage from a tenant if they strip um, or thieve pipework and boilers and things like that. Um, most policies will cover fire. That's a standard peril. Uh, so if the building catches fire, it will cover the reinstatement cost of partially reinstating or, or completely demolishing and rebuilding the building. Um, terrorism is uh, something which is included with some policies and some not. It's something that you negotiate with the insurer for an extra premium often. Um, and flooding uh, is a standard peril that is usually covered. Um, so if the property floods and there's uh, consequential losses, um, you could then have the, the building reinstated, brought back um, to sort of repair it off the back of a flood. Uh, and obviously if there's a theft, uh, somebody comes in, steals, you know, that, that um, would usually cover um, 
reinstatement of the building, but not contents. All right, our next question mark, 90 seconds on the clock. Um, what exactly represents a good yield when it comes to property investment? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be buying anything really sub maybe six percent. Um, I, I just don't think you need to. I think if you find a house in the Midlands or in the north um, and and sort of on the south coast of England, um, some of the cheaper areas, maybe Hastings or whatever, you'll be able to achieve that. Uh, as soon as you get further within, close to or within the M25, it will be almost impossible. Um, and um, for me, you know, y yes, if you did room lets or some other strategies, you could achieve that. Um, but, um, you know, I tend to go sort of 6% plus if possible. Okay, great. All right. Um, so our next question, what would you say is the most common mistake made in commercial property investment? Okay, so for me, the most common mistake in commercial property investment is to go and buy something that is extremely low yielding because you perceive that because, yes, it may have a long lease, but because the tenant has such high covenant strength and their balance sheet and their financial stability is so strong, you then pay a massively high capital value for it and maybe you buy off a 4% yield. Um, I'd much rather um, buy off maybe a, a six or probably an eight or maybe 10% yield of, um, you know, a good tenant, uh, maybe a local covenant who I think is good or, or maybe a national retailer who's, who's, who's just, you know, a good covenant instead of one of these amaz supposedly amazing ones. Uh, because we've seen the result with retail. Lots of them go through CVAs. Lots of them find ways of wriggling out of these long leases. Um, you know, when when the tide turns, uh, and if you're one of these people that has paid hundreds, if not millions of pounds extra, uh, because you perceived that that um, lease and the, the, the tenant's strength was so strong, uh, all of that capital value is going to be lost in an instant. I just think you're setting yourself up for a load of risk. Uh, it looks less risky. I think it's more risky. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, that's us finished for today. Um, Mark, if you just very quickly again tell the camera where people can find and follow you online. Okay, so you can find me online at www.progressiveproperty.co.uk. In addition, I've got a podcast which is Mark My Words. Um, so if you, you go on to your Apple podcast app or maybe Stitcher, you find me on there. I'm also on Facebook, I'm on Twitter uh, and I'm also on Instagram. All of the links to the stories and any resources that we've uh, talked about are going to be in the description below. Please remember to like and subscribe to make sure you get updates of these every single week. Uh, if you have any comments on anything we've talked about, any opinions, leave them in the comments below and we'll reply to you. We'd love to hear what you have to say and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you very much.